Let's give it up one more time for Star Parker. Thank you so much, Star. I just got up this time to remind us that at the break, right here at this table, you will be able to uh, get some books uh, signed and, and that type of thing as well. Uh, Christy, where will Star be with her book? She will, Star will be out, right outside the double doors if you want to. She only has a few copies, so we're going to get there quickly. <laughs> Quickly, but uh, and of course you can offer. I think you had a do you can offer a donation for the newsletter. And one one thing I, I love that Star said was this: capitalism is good, profit is good, and that is something that we mu must understand. That's what drives this country: is the ideas of free market and capitalism. All right, um, we're now. Up to uh, the 850 point cat, uh, and we're going to have my good friend come on up here, Harold, and do your thing, man. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Now we're entering into the um, workshop portion of our program, and not one of the goals of the at large conference is not only to inspire and encourage candidates to run for office, but we actually want to give you the tools to work with and do the speakers we have today is Jeff Landry and also Jason Abaker. Um, Jeff Landry is um, one of the, he's a, a PAC on the Republic PAC director for the um, state of Louisiana and also Jason Abaker. Um, he's actually a political consultant, successful political consultant here in Louisiana. He worked on Bobby Jindal's campaign, Steve Police, Mike Strain, and also uh, Ryan Frazier, the congressional campaign of Colorado in 2010. I'd like to bring up Jeff Landry at this time. How y'all doing this morning? Good morning. Good morning. Great. <laughs> First of all, I just want to say thank you. Uh, I want to say thank you for committing some of your precious time to come here this weekend and be a part of this at large co um, conference. Uh, just to give you a little background about who I am, I'm just a little country boy from South Louisiana. I was born and raised in St. Martinville. Uh, worked on a um, sugar farm uh, when I got out of um, high school because my mama wanted me to go to college, so I went to work instead. That's right, that's what you're supposed to do, right? You don't know, listen to your parents at that age. By 20, though, I decided that they were a lot smarter. In two years, they gained just a wealth of knowledge. Um, started my own business uh, while I was in college, and um, I was in the military, and worked my way through college, uh, sold those businesses, uh, went back to school, got a law degree, got real, Distraught with the way this country was going, and um, took my four year old son to the first Tea Party rally in New Iberia, Louisiana, and decided that I was going to run for Congress and was elected with the big 2010 class. Um, and um, and I was one of those candidates that no one said I could win. Oh, let me see. Can y'all see me? Oh, yeah, let's move this back. Let's move this back. Yeah, I don't know. It's okay. Um, and, um, and so no one said that I could win because I didn't come from any big political lineage. Uh, I ran. I've been a Republican all my life. I registered as a Republican. It, when I was 18 in, uh, in St. Martin Parish, which was a big Democrat stronghold. In fact, when I went and I um, turned in my registration card, the register of voters told me that I made a mistake. <laughs> she, 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 she handed it back to me. said, no, 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 you want to be a Democrat. I said, no, 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 I want to be a Republican. <laughs> uh, but, um, so just that's, that's kind of where I come from. What I want to talk to you about today is probably the most important um, aspect of running a campaign. 
Okay, I have run a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven campaigns personally. And I've, I've, I've lost um, uh, four of them. And one of the most important ones. So you know, Star, I'm going to tell you something. Just keep running, baby. Amen. Just keep running. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, and you learn a lot more from when you lose than when you win. That's in business, and that means the same in politics. Let me talk to you about fundraising a little bit. Okay. And here, let, me, let me kind of give you the dynamics. I kind of put that whiteboard because I wanted to kind of draw it out for you. But let me see if I can do it from here because the microphone won't go down there. Um, what happens, you decide you want to run for office. You want to run for Congress. Like Star did. And you look, and maybe it's not open seat. Maybe you got to run against a, an incumbent. You have to recognize that the first thing that that person has is name recognition. And they get that name recognition through press. And it's free for them. And the longer they stay there, the higher that name recognition goes up. Even though they have bad name recognition, any name recognition is good name recognition. And so you down here, you say, well, how do I, because my message is better, my conviction is better. What I believe in, in the direction that I want this country to go is much stronger than this person I'm running against. Because if you didn't believe that, you wouldn't be running, right? So how do I even that out? <clears throat> well, the only way you do it is with money. Okay? And, and, and it's, it's a compilation of a couple of things. Because if you have, and you don't have to have as much, Okay? But you have to have some. Because if that person is up here in name recognition and you down here, you have to have enough. And you, if your message is, is more powerful, you have to have enough to bring your name recognition up and then message up to at least an even keel. And so, yeah, you can, you can run races and, and still win even though you... You know, you don't, you don't enjoy, or you know, a two to one ratio. I say, you know, that your opponent can spend two dollars for every one dollar you spend, but you've got to have some money to move that message. Okay, you can't do it on love and volunteerness alone. I mean, it's just that's just a brutal, hardcore fact. That's a fact. All right, I ran. In, in 2006 or 2007, for the state senate, I was mad because my road was in terrible shape. I was breaking my tire every time I came on my driveway. That's how I went for the, for the state senate. I ran against two incumbent state house members. One of them had been in office for 30 plus years. So you can imagine her name recognition. Great lady. I ran as a Republican. It's two Democrats. They said, you can't win, you can't hit the board. I raised a half a million dollars in that campaign as a nobody. All right? And I edged out, I led in the first election ballot. And I lost by 300 votes in the second go round. But I was able to move my message to a point and people started resonating and understanding it. So you said, okay, well we understand, we got it. It's all about the Benjamins, how we do it. Well, this is how you do it. You have to be disciplined. It's a function of numbers. You gotta sit down and you gotta start thinking, who do I know? Who do my friends know? Who in the business community shares my beliefs? And you make a list. And you take that list and you get yourself some telephone numbers and you start calling. And you tell, you tell that person, you say, look, what's your name, ma'am? Mickey. Mickey? Yes. Okay. I go, I'd sit down, I'd tell Mickey, I'd say, now Mickey, I'm running for Congress in your district. She's a small business owner. 
And I say, do you care about taxes? Yes. Do you care about regulations? Yes. Well, guess what? I'm, I'm a business owner. I was a business owner at one time. I understand that. I need some help. Do you believe we need a change? Yes. Of course we need a change. Congress's approval rate at 13%. When I got there, I started telling people I was an attorney again. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Sit on the side of the plane, think I'm going to Congress. They said, what you got? Well, I pick up the USA today. Actually, it was at 9% back then. They said, what do you do? I said, well, I practice law. <laughs> so I tell them, I, I tell you that I need you to invest in me. And there's a return. There's a return in that. And, that, and, and the commitment that I'm going to make to you is that I'm going to work to make sure that this area has economic opportunity. And then you just go down the line and you methodically make those calls. The most important thing, though, is you got to ask them. you got to say, Mickey, I need $5,000. And now she's going to start squirming a little bit. You know, five, you know, I'm a small business owner. I say, okay, look, I know that might be kind of big. $2,500? Well, how about 1000 She might be in, you know, 1000 Yeah, you yeah. Can. You see, you yeah. But you have to make that ask. So, again, you got to make your list. You gotta get you some telephone numbers. And you gotta you gotta get you, you, you gotta start making those calls. You make a call. If you feel you you may be a person who's more comfortable seeing people. That's kind of how it is. I'm a people person. I hate to use a telephone. I get on a, I get on the road, get in my truck, and I just start going business to business. Cold calling. Some people I didn't even know. Knocking on knocking on that door, saying, look, this is what I'm doing. Guess what you're doing when you're doing that? Let me tell you something. If you got the time, that's real powerful. Because you're doing two things. You're getting a vote. Because I'm going to tell you, most of the people who will write you a check, well, let me, let me back up. If she writes me a $50 check, she's voting for me. If she writes me a $5,000 one, I don't know. That's one of them. That's guys that play, they both, they play both sides sometimes. <laughs> And that's okay. I'd sit down. Sometimes I'll tell you another trick. I'd sit down with her and she may say, well, you know, I kind of like this other person, but I like what you believe in. You know what I'd tell them? i said, tell you what, I'll make you a deal. Make you a deal. I'm only going to ask you to give me as much as you give in now. That's fair. Why don't you split it? How much were you going to give this year? A thousand? Give her 500 and me 500. <laughs> You would be amazed because as a business person and they think in politics, you know, how many of y'all go to the horse track? I know about horse racing, you box horses in, right? That's what it is, it's called boxing politics, you got like the officials in. But, but, and again, at the end of the day, it's not so, it's, it, you shouldn't worry about whether they're giving to someone else, just make sure they're giving to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay? Yeah. You, you understand what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, it, 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 and I know it, it, it flies in the face of reason sometimes. You should go, wait a minute. Listen, she can give me 500 and my opponent 500. But if my message is more powerful than my opponent's, my 500 is going to go a lot further yeah. down the line. The function of numbers. And now, I. Did they hand that out? Did they? Did they? Yes. yes. Okay. And, and I don't have my time. How much time I got? Because I'll sit up here and talk and talk and talk. Y'all make sure I don't move. I got five minutes left? Ten. You got ten. ten minutes. Okay. All right. When I would make a call, it's kind of like, probably, I don't know if it's in this order, but I'd start off with this donor tracking sheet. And you're welcome to take this. Let me tell you something. My email address is Jeff. Dot Landry at Landry for Louisiana.com. Now look at me. Don't worry. You can go to JeffLandry.com. You can email me through my website. I can send you these forms electronically. You get your donor tracking sheet. So that as you have your list, you put their names, the addresses, the emails down. You ask them. If they tell you no, check that off. You want to know about you want to know who those no's are, I'll tell you why you want to know. You want to put those aside. Because when you start climbing in the polls, you go back to them. 
and then you make a big double, okay? Uh, and then, so, and then what you do is those that are going to give, you send them an email. I, I, you, you know, you used to better send them a letter. If you want to send them a letter, that's fine. But, you know, with the, with the rate that the postage, the U.S. Post Office rates you for 50 cents a, a, a stamp, and, and you're already running on a low budget, email is free, right? You send them a little follow-up email, okay? And then you have to try to get someone to track that, okay? Because the biggest, the biggest problem you have with contributors is they're going to agree, especially if you're in person, they don't like to say no. Right? So they're going to say yes, and then you have to chase them down for that check. Don't feel bad. If they told you, if they made a commitment, you make them understand that when you make a commitment to you, you got to follow through. You send them an email, you fax them, you may have to call them again. If two weeks goes by, go back by that business and don't leave unless they hand you the check. Okay? So, you send them, you track it, you send them a little follow-up email. When you get a little bit of money in your war chest, and you can afford to try to find you uh, a list of potential donors, which you can actually build yourself if you go to OpenSecrets.com, OpenSecrets.com, you can find out on the federal level, everyone who gives, and their addresses. You make your own. Figure out where you live and where you're running for. Find out who those big donors are. And you send them a letter. And I got a sample of a letter that I sent out when I was running for Congress the first time when I won. If you leave here remembering one thing and you want to run for office, you ha it takes resources. Okay? And people out there, just like you have committed your time today to come here for a cause, there are people out there who believe in you a lot more than you think. And they're willing to speak with their pocketbooks. You just have to ask. It's just like asking them for a vote. You don't know if you're going to get a person's vote unless you ask. And I tell people all the time, you see candidates, good candidates, people that have great potential, they hate this part of the business. It is the most important part of the business. And I'll just close by telling you this. Don't believe that all the money is just in Washington, D.C. The last time I ran for office, and I lost, my opponent outspent me two and a half to one, Okay, his name recognition was much greater, you know. But let me tell you where I won. Eighty percent of my money came from outside of Washington D.C. Okay, and eighty percent of his came from inside. I raised two and a half million dollars on my own, with eighty percent of it coming from outside D.C. And what that should tell you is that in your communities, there are people who will spend a little bit of that money on people who have a vision and a conviction. Again, if you, if you want to run for office and you want to talk about fundraising, please call me. On that website, jefflandry.com is a phone number. Okay? You're welcome. I'll leave a stack of cards out there too with my email address. If you want to know more about how you can be successful in fundraising, call me. I want to help you. Thank you. God bless you. I appreciate your time. Well, guys, thank you all for inviting me. Uh, as uh, I think Harold said earlier, my name is Jason Avery. I'm a political consultant here in the state of Louisiana, and uh, uh, I think I'm supposed to be stalling while this gets pulled up. That was, that was very quick. Thank you. Um, 
I'm going to try to be as brief as I can. I brought some slides, some information to show you. When I talked to uh, Scott McKay about doing this presentation, I said, what do you want me to talk about? He said, keep it very, very simple. So that's what I'm going to do. We're going to do some of the basics today about organizing a campaign, how to get started. Um, I'll fly through some of these. If you have any questions uh, when we're done with this, feel free to ask them. In fact, I, I prefer to really just for 30 minutes to stay up here and answer questions, but I know that uh, that probably won't work. So. Uh, look, I'm going to talk a little bit about getting organized. Uh, Jeff talked a lot about raising money, and I thought that was probably a better fit for him to go first because that is such an important part of this. It's an integral part of running a campaign. You have to have that lifeblood of a campaign to make it work. But then there's some other things that you need to do, obviously, to organize a campaign. And, and these are some of the things that, uh, that I want to talk about today. And that is, of course, planning a campaign. Um, now, how many of you have, here have ever run for office before? A uh, show of hands. Okay. Uh, how many of you are interested in running for office? A uh, show of hands. Okay, so we've got some folks in here who, who understand the concept and probably want to. Um, and I know there's some folks in here in the back of the room that, are, that have worked in campaigns and continue to want to. And so one of the things I always tell a lot of can candidates and, and potential clients when they come meet with us is, before we start talking about how many signs we're going to put up, before we start talking about you know, what our message is to our voters, we, there's a lot of things that we need to put in place, a lot of building blocks. And so that's what the nature of this presentation is, and, and really starting out, talking a little bit about planning. So running a political office is a lot like building a house. Before you spend any time on, or any money on hard costs or materials, you have to start with a blueprint the budget. The same thing when you build a house. And so that's what planning is, and that's what you obviously want to start your campaign with. So what is a campaign plan? Now I try to break it down in the simplest of terms, and of course everybody has their own way of putting a campaign, campaign plan together. But a lot of times, and Jeff mentioned when you go meet with somebody and you want to ask them for money, the first thing out of their mouth may be, well, what's your plan? What's your strategy? So it's always good to have these things before you go and make that, that ask, right? So what is it? It's obviously it's your, it's your campaign and fundraising strategy. So it's what, kind of what Jeff talked about. What are we going to do to help to get some money? What is our plan? How many people have we talked to? When are we going to talk to them? What are we going to ask for? It's your budget and it's your timeline. So I'll talk a little bit about all three of these points and the steps that you need to put those together. But it's those three things written down on paper. So step one, how do you want to, how do we figure out if we're going to run for an office? Let's say we're going to run for, and I'm going to just make up a, an office here. We're going to run for a county commission or a parish, uh, a parish uh, a government office. And let's say that um, we know that there are 10,000 registered voters in the district. I'm going to use that as a round number. So what we're going to do is we're going to take 10,000 registered voters, and then we're going to start to look at our estimated turnout percentage uh, in that district in either a primary or a general election, depending on where we are. And by doing that, we can average out all the elections in the past district. So let's say that in 2012, in 2010, and 2008, in that particular district that you want to run in, turnout was, on average, 55%. So 55%. 5,500 total votes cast out of 10,000 registered voters. So we've got that number. Then we want to calculate the raw number of votes that will be cast in your race based on the estimated turnout, right? So 55%, again, 10,000, 5,500 votes are going to be cast. Then we're going to calculate the number of votes that we'll need to win the election. Well, that's pretty obvious. That's 50% plus one. So you take 50% of 5,500 and you add one vote to it. And the reason I tell people that, to, to go through that really arbitrary exercise when you begin planning a campaign is this. It's, it, and it goes back to the old adage of campaigns. You don't have to get everyone to like you. You just have to get 50% plus one to like you. And that's what it's about. It's about playing the margins. It's about knowing that you've got to, that you've obviously got to go talk to more people than that. But that's what you're striving for. That's your number. That's your magic number. So you set your entire path of your campaign around that number. That's what you're going to need. That's your goal. Your vote goal. The next thing is targeting your votes or your voters and setting goals. So now we know what our number is, right? We now know what our 50% plus one number is that we need to get. And then now we know that it's important to go back and look and, and find out where that's going to happen or how many of those votes we need to get in each one of those precincts. 
So then you basically are taking that district model that you just did, and you're breaking it down on a precinct level. Well, in this particular precinct, turnout's really low. So if there's only 300 people that turned out in that precinct on average in the last three elections, most likely there's going to be about 300 people turning out there. So what's, what's the, what do I need to get there based on 55% turnout? And what's 50% plus one in that precinct? And you do the same thing precinct by precinct. It's a tedious process. They have companies you can hire to do all the targeting for you, or you can do it yourself. And that's the beauty of this, is a lot of this information is available online. It's just knowing how to use it. And so that's an important part of going in piece by piece. And once you're able to identify your potential voters uh, in the, or, or your precincts that you know are going to have a good turnout, you're able to set a vote goal at each precinct. And you're going to add all that to what you call your GOTV or your get out the vote plan. Next thing you want to do after you sort of figured out that universe of voters that you need to go after is you need to research your issues. I talked about, you know, I, like when I was, I started out, I didn't like the way that my road was, so I ran for office. Or I started, you know, I didn't like the way that things were going on in my community, so I ran for office. But the reason you run for office may not be the, what the voters want, right? There may be some fraud, waste, or mismanagement, or abuse in an office. And it may not be the sole reason you got into this. But the more you look into it, the more you realize there's more to this race than just what you thought at the time was important. And so there's a couple ways to research those issues. Number one is polling. Polling is always the best way to do it. And we advise uh, candidates all the time if you can spend the money to poll early. And a lot of people think polling means I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into uh, an electoral area and I'm going to say if the election will held tomorrow, would you vote for Tom or for Kathy? That's not really what, a, what an early poll is, what we call a benchmark poll. An early poll tells us, what do you think about the, the, you know, the cost and size of government right now? What do you, how do you feel about what's going on in your town or in your district or in your county or your parish? What is it about the current administration that you don't like? So we ask a lot of those questions. We get people talking and we get feeding them back information to us. And a lot of times sophisticated polling techniques, especially today, gives us things like word clouds, like after, if we poll 300 people, we've got 300 respondents, what is that word or two words or three words that keeps popping up that people want, that, that, that they say is a problem, that they say needs to be changed, or what's their solution? And those are the things that we begin to pull out and use for our messaging. If you don't have the money to do polling, there's a great way to do this through keyword searching, uh, news analytics online, obviously looking at news media, whatever's going to be big and popping in your community, those are going to be big issues, probably got everybody riled up. I tell people that, you know, the old saying that the news media, they buy ink by the barrel and paper by the roll. So a lot of times if they're printing something a lot, people are reading it, so it's important. It's got people riled up. And those are some of the things that are going to be key issues in your area. And then, of course, once you get all this information down, you want to put together an issues matrix. Now, what is an issues matrix? So that's just a fancy word for, you know, I say just get on a whiteboard or a grid and just sit there and write out the top three or four things that you want to talk about. And I always tell people this, don't get outside that box, stay in it. It's like a horse, have your blinders on, stay on that message and never get off of it. So the next uh, step, we talked about this, is, those, is that three point part of your campaign plan is your budget. And I always tell people, and uh, this always a lot of times falls on deaf ears, but we're all Republicans, we're conservatives, right? I mean, that's what we talk about. We talk about less spending, we talk about keeping, you know, keeping a budget, keeping things in check. So when you run for office, and if anyone here has ever served in office, I always tell people that you run, running for office, running a campaign is basically practice for governing. Uh, and a lot of people t kind of step back on this. Why do you say that? Well, because you're in the public eye a lot, you're asking the public for things. And when you, be, when you, win and you go on to govern, you're going to find that that process that you went through in that campaign really prepared you a lot for that. And so I always tell people, if you're running for office as a Republican, chances are you're someone who agrees with sound budgetary discipline. The same principle should apply for your campaign. Um, most difficult balancing act is running for office and setting the appropriate spending priorities and staying within the campaign's means, all while doing what it takes to win. It's a very important part. Because those of you who ran for office know exactly what I'm talking about. The minute you become a candidate, ring, ring, oh, this is Joe, and I need, uh, I'm with the local JCs, and I, you're a candidate for office, and I need you to sponsor a table at our local fundraiser. Uh, well, your opponent's doing it, so that means you have to, or you're going to lose. You know, you get a lot of that kind of stuff. And what I always tell people is, look, ma'am, I'm sorry, I can't. I'm running a nonprofit organization myself. 
and I'd love to help you. And when I win, I'm going to help you. Uh, but right now, I've got to take care of getting across that finish line myself. I got to win. I got to get there. So I would appreciate it if, you know, in December, if you would ask me that question again, because I'll be there for you. And those are some of the things that you're going to get a lot of. You're going to get a lot of, hey, you know, I need you to buy a sign at the ballpark for my our kids' little league program. You know, uh, Joe Blow, who's your opponent, he bought one. You know, they, they love to, to pitch you against each other. Sir, I can't do that at this time. I'm, I'm, I'm spending my money, I'm budgeting my money to run, to go and talk to individual voters. I'm going door to door. This is my plan. I've got a plan in place, and unfortunately it doesn't fit within my plan. However, I support your group. If I can come out and volunteer for an hour, I'd love to. Love to give you my time. So those are some of the things that in your budget you're always going to want to watch for. And then, of course, the most important question in the campaign, how much is it going to cost me? Well, I always tell people, whenever I walk into a, a meeting for the first time and they're running for office, the first thing out of their mouth view is, how much is it going to cost me? And I always say, well, how much does a car cost? Well, I don't know. It depends on the car. Exactly. Yeah. Does it have cruise control? Does it have, you know, does it have sunroof? I mean, so we can build this thing as big or as little as you want to. But there's some variable factors that you want to look for in campaign. The cost of a race varies widely on a lot of things. Number one is the media market you're in. So if you're going to run television or radio, and you're going to do that in Houston, Texas, or Chicago, Illinois, or New York City, it's going to be very expensive. Uh, if you're going to do that in Lake Charles, Louisiana, or if you're going to do that in Alexandria, Louisiana, or, or Knoxville, Tennessee, it's not going to be that expensive. Why? Because the markets aren't expensive. The cost per point to make TV and radio is not that expensive. So. Other things we might want to look at is, is cable cheaper than TV? So we look at all those factors and we help you get to that, arrive to that cost that you need. The next thing, of course, is going to be the number of opponents. If you're running in a five-way race, chances are there's going to be a runoff. So you have to think about it two races instead of one. And that affects your budget, how you budget. Because obviously you're not interested in trying to get 50% plus one in a five-way race. It's mathematically impossible unless the other candidates just you know, put their name on the ballot, didn't show up. There's going to be a numbers factor here. So we're looking now at, at a, let's say a four-way race, we're looking at getting 25% plus one of the votes so that we can make a runoff. So our budget dictates a little bit different how we're going to operate. And then, of course, uh, the opposition from an incumbent. That's usually the most important thing. If you're running against an incumbent, chances are you're walking into this with a disadvantage. Incumbents, just by their very nature, are going to raise more money. They're more well-known, they've been at this a lot longer, and so that is going to factor heavily into how you want to budget things. And a lot of times I tell our, our clients when they come in and they want to run against an incumbent, don't worry that you can't outraise your opponent. Don't worry about those things. Let's focus on the smart things. Let's not concern ourselves with a lot of the fluff. Let's go with what we need to go at. Because it's not always, I mean, you look, you'd be surprised at how many times we've beaten incumbents just surely on the fact that the environment just wasn't there for them. And we took advantage of those things by spending our money with that electorate that cared about those issues. And so those are the things that you're going to want to look at. And of course, we talked about the number of runoffs. Um, research campaign finance reports from older races or races in similar districts. So for instance, you, know, you can go online and find uh, how much did it cost to run your particular race four years ago or eight years ago? How much did it cost to last year to run the same district race in another parish or another county or another town? Or, or another congressional district, whatever it is. Uh, you can kind of get a feel from your local area based on uh, what those race costs. And then of course, to be better than your opponent, you're going to have to know the best way to spend this money correctly. It's important to keep a low burn rate. When I talk about burn rate, I preach this. And let me tell you, there is nothing worse than a campaign. And we've taken over some that, oh, the campaign's in bad shape. Can you come work with us? You know, We've been at this for six months and we're going nowhere. And so we'll go sit down with these campaigns and we'll sit down with them and say, can we take a look at your budget? Yeah. We take a look at what you've spent so far and it's like, they've already spent 70% of the money that they've raised and it's only you know, six months out from the campaigns. You have to remember to keep a low burn rate early. Here's what I'll tell everybody. You want to try to spend between 75% to 80% of your total campaign budget inside of 30 days. In other words, take election day, back it up 30 days. From that time frame is when you want to spend anywhere from about 70, 75, 80 percent of your budget. Now, that's going to take a lot of discipline, but that's when the fish are biting. That's when the voters care. That's when they're paying attention. So you want to make sure that you've got the money. How many, how many of you heard this sentence? Well, he lost that election because he peaked too early. 
Have you ever heard that? You know what that is? That's code for he ran out of money. And that's why you have to make sure that it's, it's a marathon, not a sprint, and that there's a time when the voters are paying attention. And they're paying attention in that little sweet spot. I always say that sweet spot in the campaign is the 21 day mark. Because at that point in time, that's when about 70 to 80 percent of the voters are making their mind up. You're going to have your people on either side, and you're going to hear from them the most early on, right? We go to we go to Republican women's clubs, and we know that people are paying attention to it, right? So we go to a, you know maybe it's a JCs or a, or a Rotary or something. People, most of those people are informed and paying attention, but it's that average voter, it's that average Joe that you know does shift work or teaches school or whatever. They, they're just not paying attention until a certain point in time. So you want to make your money count at the time when they start paying attention. And then, of course, uh, Jeff talked a lot about fundraising, so I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on it, but drafting a fundraising plan is a part of your campaign plan. It's just sort of like a mini plan within it. And that's, you know, how much will it take to run your campaign? It's important to plan uh, how and when you need to start raising money, because obviously that's the, that's the first part. When you want to run for office, that's the first thing you need to focus on. Not, you know, how many signs are we going to put up, or who's going to share this thing or that thing. You know, it, I hate to say it, it's the lifeblood of politics, and a lot of times what happens is, is you'll put that, you'll raise that money, and you'll file that report with the FEC or with your ethics, your local ethics board, and that's what everybody's going to see. And that's the early strength of you as a camp candidate. You always find the reporters they love to write, oh, so and so raised this much money this quarter against so and so. Well, he's got the edge. You know, so that's a, it's almost like a campaign within a campaign. So if you can raise that money early, Get it in there. I would, you know, he who has gold makes the rules, the golden rule. You know, so you want to make sure that you're doing that and doing it early. And then, of course, identify your strengths and potential sources of money. And Jeff talked a lot about that. And then your fundraising timeline. I want to have. It's just like setting goals and priorities in your life. I want to have X amount of dollars by such date. I want to know that I can do. You know, I'm going to raise, be able to raise this much money by this date. And don't be discouraged early on if you can't raise a lot of money, and a lot, because a lot of that is. The fact that nobody's really paying attention to the race, so there's just not a lot of interest in it, so there's not a lot of giving. But once things start kind of popping in the race, all of a sudden, you know, it picks up a little bit more. So don't look at it as, well, I was unable to get, you know, three months or eight months out from an election, and I've spent the last three months raising money, and, and there's just no interest, but I've got something, it'll pick up. And it always has a tendency to, the amount of money that you can raise always is sort of analogous to the amount of interest that continues to work in a campaign. And then of course, finally, your campaign timeline is that last piece of the campaign uh, plan that you want to put together. Now, it's important when you put together a timeline that it's not a schedule. In other words, it's not where you're going to be on Thursday or where you're going to be on Friday. Your campaign timeline is sort of the you know, it's the timeline that gives you an overview of where things are going to be happening, and I think I've got some information in here on it. So these are some of the things that you'll put in that timeline. So your four, it's pretty really 90 days, 60 days, you do all these different types of, of filings. And then, um, you know, things like dates for hiring staff and opening headquarters. When do we, kind of, when do we want to do those things? It doesn't have to be an exact date, but when do we want to, to put those things in place? Uh, when do we want to start polling? Um, you know, when do we want to start our neighborhood walks? And, so on and so forth. What's the best time to start radio and television? When do we want to schedule direct mail? Again, sweet spot, 21 days, 30 days. Those are times where you're going to be doing a lot of that. And then, of course, what are our dates for absentee voting and early voting? Now, we've got to get out of this mindset of calling it absentee. It's more early voting now. Um, and then what is, what, is the, what is it that we're going to do, take election day, work backwards 72 hours to start that get out the vote of that GOTV effort? So that's all your timeline. It's just sort of like a, a, a roadmap, a view down the road of what you, what you know what you're going to be doing and when you're going to be doing it. And so sort of the second part of this uh, presentation was to talk about staff. Um, now, staffs vary depending on the size of the race, how much money you have. Um, but a lot of times, the titles that people have doesn't. And I say that for a reason. You may have a campaign manager, and a campaign manager may be a professional person that is a hot shot out of DC that you brought in and you hired them, you're paying them $6,000 a month and they're running your campaign. Or a campaign manager may just be a very, very good friend of yours who's retired and wants to give you a lot of their time to help. So to say you have a campaign manager, that could, that could vary. But it's always important to have one. And why, why I say that is this, and it's kind of an overview of a candidate. Campaigns are in nirvana, right? They're in their best part when you as a candidate are doing two things, raising money and asking for the vote. And that's it. 
You're not running to the grocery store to get food for the party. You're not going to the bank to deposit checks. You're not out there putting up a sign that somebody called and said it's broken. You are raising money and you're asking for the vote. So your manager handles everything else. That's their job. Joe, can you handle this? I gotta go and knock doors. Joe, can you handle this? I've got a fundraising meeting or dinner uh, tonight at seven and I gotta go get ready. They wanna talk about X, Y, and Z. So that's really what your manager is. So then you've got sort of some lower level jobs, I would call them lower level, but jobs that probably could be folded into the manager's position, but if you have a big enough campaign, like a congressional campaign, these are some of the things you need. So a political director. A political director is the guy or the girl that sets up your neighborhood walks. They put together the literature, they target the neighborhoods. They, you know, you show up, somebody hands you a packet full of push cards, these are the seven, 17 doors you're gonna walk in this neighborhood, we're gonna go to this neighborhood and walk another 44 doors, and here they are. And that's really what your political director is. They organize the volunteers. They get them there. They're on the phone all day saying, we need 30 people from the Republican Women's Club to come help us make phone calls at this phone bank. That's a lot of what they're doing. Obviously, a scheduler is good if you can have one. And again, your schedule is going to be so jam-packed in the heat of a campaign. So you're going to want, hopefully, have somebody there to help you with that. Again, it could be your manager, depending on the size of your campaign. And then, of course, an office manager and a database operator. The reason I, tell, I ask for something like this is if you have a big enough campaign, somebody's got to pay the light bill. Somebody's got, you know, somebody's got to do those day-to-day -day things. Somebody's got to schedule the volunteers. Somebody's got to put all that together. And so if you could afford someone, or usually that office manager type person is, again, maybe a retired person or like a super volunteer that's really helping out with the campaign. And then these are sort of volunteer and grassroots team duties. I wouldn't call them jobs or professions. Volunteer coordinator, phone bank, door-to-door -door coordinator, absentee and early vote coordinator. Remember, and I don't know, I'm sure most of you might be from all over the country, so most of you are from Louisiana. Again, every state's different, but we now have, in most states, at least seven days of early voting. And I don't want to get into this too much, but I can't stress to you how important that is and since 2002. Most of you remember Bush v. Gore, y'all remember what happened in Florida. Well, the Congress passed what was called the Help America Vote Act, or HAVA. In Louisiana and some other states in the South, if you wanted to go absentee vote, you had to walk in, and most of you have done this, you walked into your clerk's office, your registrar's office, and used to sign an affidavit saying, under penalty of perjury, I'm not going to be in the county or in the parish. I need to vote early, or I need to vote absentee. Now, it's not like that. You can walk in seven days early and you can go vote, right? You can go pull the lever at your, wherever it is, your, your courthouse, your, your, your county clerk, your regist parish registrar. So what I tell candidates is this, you have six, in some cases, seven election days before you have election day, right? I mean, we go get votes. In some of these states, like in Texas, it's 52% of the total turnout is going to happen early. So that's a very important part of an election that we're just now starting as an electorate to really understand the complexity of how you work an early vote strategy. So the more you can have people focusing on that, the better off you are. And then, of course, things like an event coordinator, somebody to help you set up your events and take them down, you know, book the, the ballroom or whatever it is. Communications, that's great. Usually, but a lot of communications coordinators now are, a lot of days, are sort of social media coordinators. Guys are maybe helping you do that daily Facebook post or those tweets or what you need. And then coalition chairs and precinct captains, and I'll talk a little bit about both of those. Your coalition chair is a community leader associated with a social club, place of worship, ethnic group. Uh, local organization, uh, and then someone who will help recruit and mobilize. I always do this, go out and get you a small business coalition, right? Or, uh, you know, whatever it is, uh, uh, Second, Alive, uh, Second Amendment or Pro-Life Coalition. And the reason is, if you can build coalitions, right, if you can have a, a small business coalition leader, and let's say that your opponent is, uh, you know, past some job-killing regulation. Well, you want that person. You don't want to stand up and say, my opponent is wrong for this district because he or she most, you know, voted for this job-killing regulation. You want that person to stand up and say, this is how it affects my business personally. And that's why I'm supporting candidate X. Because this person's out of touch, and their regulations are killing our jobs. And so those coalition leaders help you through the earned media. Whatever that issue is, they help you tell the story. They help you tell your story to the voters because it's the way they've impacted their lives. You know, pro-life coalition people are great because they could, you know, I did, I did a, um, a congressional race out in Colorado. We had this woman that headed up our pro-life coalition. She was the product of a, a botched abortion. 
and it was about how she came to peace with her mother. And it was just a, it was just a really touching uh, person. And we we you know she was we used her to help us get the message out about this and about how important it was. And it wasn't mean spirited. It wasn't divisive. But it was just such a strong message. And you would be surprised at how well received that is with her sometimes. And so you never know. There's somebody out there. Everybody knows somebody that has that personal story, whatever it is, for whatever issue. And so the more you can do those things, the more, that's what coalition leaders and coalition chairs are. They help tell the story about their particular issue. Um, precinct captains. Precinct captains, basically, again, this is sort of like your super volunteer, right? This is your volunteer who is willing to take ownership of a particular precinct. There is nothing greater than a volunteer loves than to have a responsibility, a title, and some ownership. They love them. So the more you can give them, the better off you are. So you want to be able to go to those people and say, look, you're here every day. You're working your tail off of this campaign. I'm going to give you these two precincts, and your job is to get my vote out. Here's my vote goal. You know, here's the tactics we want to use, walks, calls, whatever. Take ownership and go get it. And a lot of times what you'll find is there's enough people in your campaign that are working in their precinct captains are kind of competing against each other. It's kind of a friendly competition. And so the more titles, the more associations that you can give to particular people, volunteers, it's amazing how much you'll get how much productivity you'll get out of them. And then of course, <clears throat> you'll want to stop when you're recruiting your precinct captains, you want to start with your priority precincts. What are priority precincts? Those are the areas closest to you where you know you're going to get the most of your vote. So that's where you want to start first. And then of course, again, give volunteers specific duties when you have volunteers. Hey, can you recruit five new volunteers this week? You know, don't just say, hey, can you help me recruit some people? Because it's kind of like what Jeff said. You know, he said, can you give me 5,000? Well, I can't. Well, can you give me 2,500? If you don't give people specific, if you don't ask for specific things, you'll never really get an honest answer. So the more that you're specific with people when you're asking for things, the better off that they are to understand, okay, yeah, I need, that, it's a tangible thing that they can get in their mind. If I were to walk up to somebody and say, hey, can you go get me volunteers? Yeah, okay, wow. But if you can get me 20, now it's a number that I've got to strive for. So we all want to obviously um, invite, you know, some of the other duties, invite friends to receive email updates. We want to try and get that done. We want to help uh, the campaign uh, identify, register, and turn out voters by participating in phone banks and door-to-door -door operations. Write letters to the editor. Hey, people come to you, can I help? Yeah, sure. Talk about those coalition people. Uh, I'd like you to write a letter to the editor talking about why this job killing regulation is, you know, it's hurting my business. Or it might be a local volu you know, volunteer says, look, my roads are in disarray. And I just, you know, I'm working with you because I just can't stand candidates. Hey, can you do me a favor? Put that in a letter to the editor and send it to the local paper. You know, those are some of the things that volunteers can do too. And then, of course, host a party in their home and volunteer for local events uh, where you need help. And then, of course, where do you recruit volunteers? Well, everybody has their own place where they recruit their volunteers. These are just some helpful hints. Local festivals and sporting events. Uh, you know, if your kid plays soccer or football, a lot of times the parents of that team, you know, might be good friends, so you can recruit them there. Republican women's clubs or men's clubs, young Republicans, college Republicans. College Republicans are great because a lot of them have the time. Um, you know, uh, holiday card lists so that those people that you're sending your holiday cards to every year most likely are probably good friends. So that's a good person, a good people to reach out to. Churches, you know, you have to kind of be careful sometimes with the using the church, but sometimes the people you go to church with are your friends. I mean, they're your peers. They're people you worship with, so they're good people to reach out to. Senior citizens groups. Obviously, most senior citizens probably retired, have a lot of time on their hands, probably looking for something to do. It's a great opportunity to, to reach out to. Service clubs are great, because a lot of them need service hours, like Rotary, Lions, Kiwanis, YMCA, Chambers of Commerce, JCs, Junior League. They all need, they're, they're volunteer in spirit, because they all belong to those clubs. So they're a great group of people to reach out to. Of course, your veterans organizations are always awesome. American Legion, Disabled Veterans, VFW. And then, of course, any type of fraternal organization is great as well. And that's your Moose, your Elks, Masons, Knights of Columbus, those types. So those are great opportunities for you to go out, have a good conversation with different clubs, ask for their help, ask for volunteers. Hey, can I get five of you today here to help me run my campaign? You know? I don't need you to put the show of hands up, but I'm going to come around today and I'm going to ask. I hope five of you today will support me. Come on board my effort. You always got to give those specific asks because you'll find how, you'll, you'll be surprised at how much you'll say, oh yeah, I can do that. And I believe that's the end of this. Do you, does anybody have any questions?
anecdotal stuff. Does anybody have any? Does anybody have anything they want to share about any particular time they were on a campaign trail? Any good story? Mr. Woody, go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, Jason, I, I loved your presentation, and I agree with it totally, really. I think one of the most important things is about establishing those vote goals in each precinct. That's fundamental to politics per dollar. A person fundraiser raised $3,500. Now, we used another principle, and that was to take that money, not a lot of money now, but it was a lot then, and we spent it all, 100%, on television on the 6 o'clock news. So what that gave us was a dominant position way early on television, very unexpected for somebody running in a district in North Baton Rouge to be on Baton Rouge television. So we were up there establishing name recognition 10 months before there was a campaign, before anybody else was even campaigning. And what happened then was as I'm knocking on doors and as I'm making phone calls to raise money, they've already heard about me. I'm sort of a household name because I was on TV. One of the problems is spending your money on a lot of different things early, you don't target it. But if you target and be dominant in one media, I don't care if it's billboards or radio or television, be dominant in something. But so this is, if you're not going to have a lot of money otherwise, use your early money to position yourself so that you can raise the money later in the campaign. Now tell me about your that race. Was it open seat? That was open? Uh, that was at a time uh, there were no Republicans in the legislature. I was running as a Democrat. There were six of us Democrats running in North Baton Rouge. The leading candidate was Mr. Henry Bozeman. He, he was a well-known contractor who had gotten ninety percent of the vote in the previous election in that race, which the previous race had been parish wide. So he'd lost. But in that district, he got 90%. So everybody thought he was going to, uh, he was going to win. But so we established ourselves early, going door to door, but giving credibility from being in the media. See, when you knock on the door, if nobody knows who you are, it doesn't have a lot of credibility. But if they've seen you in the media, now you have credibility. But probably the most important thing we did in that campaign, the winning thing. We've gotten from Barry Goldwater's campaign and for the U.S. Senate, I think it was in about 1952, he defeated the Senate Majority Leader, a Democrat. And one of the things he did was he used yard signs very powerfully. And we did that in that campaign. Yard signs is one of the ways you can change the perception of who's going to win. But only if you're very careful with it. If you get yard signs and you dribble them out, it's very ineffective. What Goldwater did in that campaign and what we duplicated was this. We started getting the names of people who wanted yard signs, but we refused to put up the yard signs. And they were begging us, and they were killing us. Yeah. Everyone was telling me, give us yard signs, our opponents have yard signs. We didn't really care about yard signs on side streets. We were looking for locations on major thoroughfares, yeah. only in people's homes, not in businesses, not on vacant lots or whatever. So we learned the techniques for getting yard signs, and there's a very specific technique that you have to use to get them. But anyway, on a, on a road like Evangeline, from Scenic Highway to Airline, it's three miles. There's 290 homes. We had 265 yeses to put yard signs on that street, and that was the way we did it on all the streets. Two weeks before the election, on a Sunday night, we went up all night putting up all of our yard signs. Yes. So we probably had a 3,000 yard signs the next morning. Yeah. Now, my leading opponent, he's on his way to work. He already had up a lot of yard signs. He's on Wimber. He sees our first sign and he says, look, Jenkins finally put up a yard sign. The kid doesn't know what he's doing. He, look how late it is. And then he saw the next one in the next yard and the next one in the next yard and the next one in the fourth yard. And at that point, he lost control of his vehicle, went up in the yard, ran over a sign. I'm sure by accident, of course. And I know this because his son told me. But the election was psychologically over at that point because he was debilitated. Bill McMahon, who was the uh, advocate columnist, he's running through North Baton Rouge, and in his, his next Sunday morning column, the next Sunday, he says, well, I drove through North Baton Rouge. Looks like Jenkins going to win. And so then we got last-minute money, too. But... But I'd say concentrating money early on on dominate immediate. You understand how to use yard signs. 
save them and put them up all at one time, big impact. Yeah, I, I agree with the yard sign thing. I, I, I love the, the idea of one of a one day blitz, sort of sh a show of force. Um, one thing I will tell you though about uh, going up on TV too early, I, I, the dynamics of the campaigning has changed so much with social media and the internet. And most of you know that. And a lot of times what we're finding is, is that there's cheaper, faster ways to be able to get name ID out earlier than in the days where television was really the dominant medium. I think mail too were really those major, and look, there's nothing against them now because they still are dominant. But I think that there's, and, and, and Scott McKay can tell you because he's one of the, the geniuses on the web, and we got some good guys here, Paul Dietzel, there's good guys here that understand this process. There's an opportunity to target voters early on through social media that allow you, I think, to sort of pull back a little bit on raising, on spending that money too early. So not to say that I disagree, I just think that there's other there's other ways now I think that you can do that, incorporate that. But I love your idea on the science. That's a perfect, it's a great example uh, of, of how you really sort of win the war within the war, which is that psychological uh, campaign within a campaign of science. So any other questions? I know my time's up here. Anyone? Okay, thank y'all very much, appreciate it.